excited and ready to celebrate what the Lord has done for us this morning. Yeah, well, we're just going to sing about it. So come on, let's put your hands together with us this morning. Sometimes you gotta stare down the giant 
Sunday, and aren't you glad to be in church? We're going to sing about the living hope and what he's done for us, but he is our living hope, right? We can look to him, we can thank him for all that he's done for us. Let's just lift our hands to him and just thank him right now. Father, we just thank you, God. Thank you for being our hope. Thank you for being our joy. Thank you for being our peace. Lord, we just worship you. We thank you, God.
God, we just thank you for your cross. We thank you for what you've done on the cross. Come on, let's praise him. Are you thankful for what he brought you through? Are you thankful for what he's done in your life? Lord, we just thank you, God. We thank you for what you've done on the cross. We thank you for your presence in this place. We thank you that you continue to be with us throughout the week. Lord, whatever we're facing, whoever comes in that needs a touch from you, God, I just thank you that your presence is here to meet their needs. Lord, we just thank you that you just move on our hearts in this service. Lord, that you speak through our pastor. And Lord, I just pray that you just reveal yourself to us in a new way this morning. We just thank you. We thank you for your presence in our lives. And everybody said, amen. Well, you can turn around and greet your neighbors. Say, we're glad to see you this morning. Good morning, good morning. How is everybody doing today? I'm a mess up here, I'm sorry. Uh, hey, we are so glad that you are with us this morning and getting to celebrate this Palm Sunday as we approach Easter time. If it is your first time with us, we just wanna say welcome and thank you for being with us today. Uh, we, are, we know there's a lot of places you could have been and we are just appreciative that you decided to come be with us this morning. Um, if it is your first time, there is a welcome home card located in the seat in front of you. Uh, we ask that you would take a moment to just fill that out. Um, you can drop it in the slots located in the back of the sanctuary after church or pastors David and Zara will be in the foyer and they would love to trade that card for a gift and just greet you and hug your neck and uh, welcome you to church this morning. Um, but we also like to just take that moment to connect with you. Um, we're not going to harass you or um, come hunt you down or anything like that, but we do want to connect with you and just kind of hear how your experience went this morning. Um, also, there is a QR code located on the back of the seat in front of you as well. Uh, if you would prefer to just scan that with your phone um, and, and fill it in that way, we also, you know, it's a great place to put your prayer requests. If there's something you like, Pastor reads through all of those uh, during the week and he prays over those specifically. Um, so if you have a prayer request even that you'd like to put on that card or in that uh, in that QR code, we absolutely would encourage you to do that. Um, so next week is Easter Sunday, and uh, we are going to be doing things a little bit differently in that we are going to have two services. We are anticipating for a whole lot of people to come worship with us, and so um, we'll have service at 9 and 11. So if you show up at 10, you'll either have to catch the end of the first one, the beginning of the second one, um, or maybe just stay for 11. Um, either way, we would love to have you guys here. Um, in order for us to prepare properly and make sure that we have enough volunteers, um, if you you are that in front of you, On the, um, on the screens behind me. But this is just to give us a heads up of, hey, you know, which service you might be coming to um, along with how many kids you might be bringing so that we can be, like I said, properly ready in advance to um, the service. to bring you we want you to know what's going up here coming up March and the second on Facebook registration for youth summer is on March 27th to secure your And uh, so, any team, the nursery will be back to being in the nursery, and the mother's uh, room will be open again, and all. And uh, so, it's a good time. 
it's a great thing. And so I want to give you another update. thousand dollars has come in. I told you that I've committed to a minimal of five thousand dollars. And so it just helps uh, even better. And uh, so thank you just for those of you who have had. year as well. This will actually be the first time that Darren and I have been out of the country and and so uh, that's really something that I'm praying about the time frame of that. We believe in our students, but we also believe that just the power I would encourage you to uh, jump online. And listen to that. One thing to come to church is another thing to actually know the people. That just need more. What's out of me? I can hear it in your. And so, whether it's you and your spouse, you and your kids, I believe if you're the parent. Will specifically the story of this last week of Jesus' life and really how it applies to us and what he has given us for history. Why? Because it had the biggest impact that the world has ever known. So, you know, I, I want to share some things today along so the context of this here in a few minutes as to why they did And then I want to blow off of it. Thank you to Jesus for the cross. Most of us, we want, like, it, it's hard to us just to say thank you. Yeah, I just we really begin to look. Now, just because we don't deserve it, and even if we'll take this time this week to wait, that slows us down. So the writer of Hebrews here is actually talking. He says, Not everything's going to pay off good for me. And our faith, some versions of the all of the pain and the suffering that we had a picture of what his sacrifice, which was the ultimately the you this week to go read Isaiah 53, all of it. It's not that long. It's about, I think it's 15 or 16 verses. Um, I'm going to read you two scriptures here, but it talks about, it's a prophecy written about seven to 800 years before Jesus actually appeared on the earth. So this is, a, what is a prophecy? It's something that somebody in the past speaks ahead of time. And Jesus fulfilled many, 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 like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of prophecies. There's over 300 messianic prophecies, which were specifically that would identify him as the Messiah. Because there's a lot of people who have claimed to be the savior of the world, but not all of, actually, none of them have really fulfilled. Because, I mean, it was down to where he would be born, where he would go. I mean, there was, there, I mean, everything about Jesus' life was foretold. That he would be born, that he'd be, that he would go to Egypt. That I mean, there's all of these things that were foretold of. And, and here Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, looks into the, almost like a telescope into the future, and he begins to describe what he's seeing which is really about Jesus coming and Jesus paying the ultimate price. And here in verse 10 of Isaiah 53, it says, It was the Lord's good plan to crush him and to cause him grief. It says, Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, that right there is the whole reason that Jesus came. 
He came to be an offering for sin that was not his. It says that he would have many descendants. It says that he will enjoy a long life and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. It says that when he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. If I was to rewrite this, this is how I would, this is how I would write it. Is that when Jesus looks at you, when you're standing before him in heaven, he would say, you were worth it. Not just everybody else. I mean, like, Jesus will lock eyes with you as an individual and say, you were worth all of the pain, all of the ridicule, all of the anguish, all of the suffering, the separation from God. You were worth it. Salvation is not just mass level, in a sense, uh, application. It's very personal. It's, it's one-on-one is that Jesus didn't just die for the masses, he died for us as individuals. And it says when he sees all accomplished by what he did, that he will be satisfied. In other words, there would be no regret for him. He'll say every bit of it was worth it. He goes on and it says, because of, of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted as righteous, for he will bear all of their sins. That's great news for all of us. Jesus didn't just pick and choose which sins he would pay for. He didn't just take care of the petty sins. He took care of the big ones too. Now here's the thing. We want to label them as petty and big. How many of you know in God's eyes though, sin is sin. It's all the same. I remember when I was in Bible school, one of my uh, teachers, he made this statement. It stuck with me for so many years. He says that when God looks at me, he looks at me through blood-stained eyes. Is he no, no longer looks at any of us for what we have done. He looks at us through the sacrifice of Jesus if we've accepted it. Yes. And so Jesus, even as it's the, really the Bible says, the ultimate judge, when he looks at us, he's not looking for good and bad. He's looking, are you covered by the blood that was sacrificed for you or not? That's really the only two options. And here it says that it, Jesus bears all of our sins. And so I would encourage you this week that this is a great reminder, but it's also a great time to reflect not just on the why that Jesus came. Most of us could say why Jesus came. But I would encourage you to think about who he came for. Not just the why, think about who. And don't just think about everybody else, like who is you? Think, like, make it as personal as you can. Because Jesus did not come to restore us to just have some good behavior. It's not about behavior modification, just being a little bit better than I was last week, last month, last year. Like you don't need to pull out, you know, well, where was I last year? And how many scriptures did I read last year? Like all of that, you're missing the whole point of the gospel. Look, we ought to read our Bibles. We ought to be engaging with the scriptures. Why? Because the Bible says it's the bread of life. It brings life and wisdom and understanding to us. So we need God's word. It's wisdom unto us. But if you think your Bible reading is going to get you to heaven, it's not. If you think all of your prayers are going to get you into heaven, they're not. There's nothing wrong with reading. There's nothing wrong with praying. I would encourage you to do them as often as possible. But you have to understand that's not what qualifies you. All of your good works, all of your good deeds, all of your giving, all of your serving, all of that is a response to Jesus. It's not for Jesus. It's a big difference. And, and so today I want to look at some of these things. And, and so really, if you want to boil it down, Jesus came not to just reveal himself as God, which he is. There's no doubt about it. But he really came to bring us back into an actual relationship with God. We see this in Genesis. Adam and Eve were created in the garden in, in perfection. And the Bible says that God would come and walk and talk with them in the cool parts of the day. They would just walk and have conversation. This was normal for them. And yet when sin entered the picture, there became a break. In, in other words, you could say it this way. There was a violation in the relationship between Adam and Eve and God. And because of that violation, there was a separation. And, in, and that separation existed until the moment that Jesus breathed his last breath. And with the words that, that right before that, what did he utter? It is 
finished. What was finished? The price that needed to be paid to put us back into relationship with God. That was what, what he accomplished. And, and so I, I want to encourage you today because we all get discouraged. Every single one of us, none of us are immune of getting discouraged because we know our humanity. We know all of our faults. We know all of our failings. And many times we, you can say it like this, is, man, we can just be a little bit too human. But I've got good news. Jesus is kind of fond of human beings. Like, he's not surprised. Sometimes when you think like, oh, I'm embarrassed, he's seen it before. Like, I'm not trying to make light of it, but also don't make it out like somehow you've created some new thing that Jesus hasn't seen that he's going to be like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe that they would do that. No, the Bible says that he looks at us with an everlasting love. This is the beauty of the gospel. And so, you know, I, I believe, though, that, that many times that, that because we're so aware of our natural carnality, if you will, which is just our flesh, many times that's why we want to try to pay the Lord back. We want to try to do good things like, Lord, aren't you impressed? Aren't you pleased with this? And so I did this and I went here and, man, I, you know, I've gone four days. I've read my Bible. Jesus, aren't you happy? Like I've done all of these things. And we're trying to earn a salvation that we didn't earn to begin with. So if you didn't pay for it, how can you pay it back? That wasn't in my notes. You're welcome. <laughs> it's an interesting thought, isn't it? If you didn't pay for it, how do you pay it back? It's a gift. Salvation is a gift to be experienced, to be lived, to be walked out. And, and so I, I know, you know, that really a, a lot of times the root of, of, of having a, a hard time receiving a gift is actually rooted in pride. And really it's a, it's a drive, and, and pride drives us to this self-sufficiency. All of us really want to be self-sufficient. I got this. I can do this. I got, it's the, it is the human condition it, it ultimately it is sin it's what adam and eve fell into which was pride to say i know better than god and god here's the thing when you think about the garden of eden god said they could have everything in the garden except for one thing they were not limited god just reserved one thing and said that belongs to me just don't touch that and then the serpent came in and deceives them now, the Bible says that he actually deceived Eve. It doesn't say that he deceived Adam. I think Adam just went along with his wife, unfortunately, when he should have taken authority. I'm not blaming Eve. I'm actually putting more of the, the weight on Adam. The Bible tells us she was deceived, which makes me think he was like, she's doing it, I'm going to do it. And in that moment, because when... When he ate, the Bible says their eyes were open and they realized their fallen nature in an instant. See, here's the thing is that none of us are self or are, are even remotely, there is nothing sufficient that we could ever give to Jesus to say thank you. There's no amount of works, effort, energy, goodness. There's nothing that we could do that would ever warrant like him to say, hey, I appreciate that. We're even, no, I will always be indebted to Jesus. Always. No matter all that I would accomplish, it doesn't matter. None of it, let me say this way, everything that we accomplish is because of what he's done for us. Yeah, and so it's important that, that we don't try to just fall into the traps of trying to perform or to earn, to strive, to deserve. We're always wanting to try to add something to the grace of God. But let me tell you that God's grace is enough for you. In every situation, in every circumstance, everything that you're worried about, everything that you're fretting about, everything that you're anxious about, Jesus' grace is enough for you. The grace of Jesus is enough for your sin. It's enough for your failings. It's enough for everything that you think is wrong with you that the enemy tries to remind you of because he will. The Bible says he's the accuser of the brethren. In other words, if you ever have a, a negative thought about you, more than likely it's not your own thought. 
The Bible talks about the fiery darts of the enemy. He's trying to land a negative thought and say, well, what's a negative thought? Anything that doesn't agree with God's word. Because you can't know what's bad if you don't know what's good. So what does God's word say about you? I mean, yes, it acknowledges that, hey, we were sinners, but now we've been saved by the grace of God. And so we can't just identify with what we know in the natural realm. We have to get into God's word and really discover who we are now in Christ. The Bible says we've been created anew in Christ. Old things are passed away. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Behold, all things have become new. And sometimes we need to remind ourselves, especially if we've walked with the Lord for a while, of where we were when Jesus found us. We can lose sight of those things if we're not careful. I mean, I remember and I try very hard to remember the hopelessness that I had, the frustration that I had before I had turned my life and really surrendered my heart to Jesus. Like I, I try to keep that towards the forefront of my mind because I want to remember why I turned to him to begin with. I, don't, I, I never want to take what he's done for me for granted. So we can never deserve God's grace, but we can only receive it. It, it, it. You can only receive it as a gift. That's it. I mean, you know, and, and so Ephesians chapter 2 says this. I'm going to read in verse 4. It says, because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, transgressions, in our sin, even while we were dead, it is by grace that you've been saved. God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ in order that in the coming ages that he can show the incomparable riches of his grace. And it's expressed in his kindness to us in Jesus Christ. Now pay attention to this verse right here. For it is by grace, and I'm going to add something, and by grace alone that you have been saved through faith. In other words, grace is available to everybody every individual, but we have to put our faith in the grace of Jesus. In other words, we have to welcome it. We have to receive it. This is not from ourselves. It is the gift of God, not by work so that no one can boast. So I don't care what, what you think your pedigree is, what your family line is, how long you've been serving the Lord. You have nothing to brag about. Grace is the ultimate leveling field. We all walk in on the same plane, undeserving. And yet God who is rich in grace, God who is rich in mercy, has poured out his grace, and it's for a purpose. It says here in verse 10, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ to do good works, which he prepared for us to do in advance. Now this is a nuanced thing here, but you have to understand this. You were created in Christ to do good works. You're not doing good works to be in Christ. And we get that backwards all the time. We think the more I do, the more Jesus is going to approve of me. You're as loved right now as you will ever be loved by your heavenly Father. There's nothing that you could do to move the needle just a little bit. But as a response to him... And out of, out of the life that we now experience because of what he has done for us, yes, good works will come. But it's not in an earning sense. It's in a responsive sense. And so when we begin to think about grace, I, I would encourage you that it's, it's not grace and. No. By grace you are saved and nothing else. It's not and something else. It's not with something else. It's not plus this it's not, yeah, it, it, it's, it, it is grace, but it's that. No, no, no. It's just grace. By grace alone have you been saved. There's nothing else besides the grace of God that makes us acceptable unto him. And this is important. Even as we're looking at this week and kind of walking through this week, I would encourage you, take a few minutes and begin to think about the grace of God. The Bible says that he has poured out in an abundance towards us. He's not shorthanded. And whatever you have need of, Jesus is enough. He really is. 
And so how do we properly respond to something, a gift, the gift of grace that we just know that we don't deserve? Like if I can't do good works to say thank you, then what do I do? Our proper response is actually full-hearted devotion and worship. In other words, Jesus, I'm all in with you. I'm not reserving anything back. I, I'm fully committed. There's nothing I'm holding back from you. If I can trust you to pay the price of my sins, then there's nothing that I can't trust you with. And so the way that we do this is, is we can do it through devotion. Yes, we read our Bibles. Yes, we pray. Yes, we seek after a relationship with him. We want to grow in our knowledge and our understanding. Sure. But it can't just be ritual. It can't just be routine. There has to, it has to produce this worship out of the inside of you. Well, what's worship? Well, I thought we were just singing some songs. Ain't that worship? For some of us. We were, many of us were just singing the same songs together. Not all of us were worshiping. Why? Because worship is a position and an attitude of the heart, not a position of the tongue. It's not an intellect that reads words and just sings them with everybody else. You're just singing a song. Worship comes from a heart of gratitude and of thankfulness unto the Lord, recognizing what he has accomplished and done for me. And out of that, this gratitude begins to well up out of my soul, and I begin to sing, and I begin to declare who Jesus is and what he has done for me. And what happens is, is that when I begin to glorify him, he begins to draw me unto him. I begin to sense his presence right in the here and the now. Like, I don't have to, I mean, th this is crazy to me, but I believe some people will get to heaven, step into the presence of God and go like, oh my gosh, I had no idea what peace felt like. I had no idea what being fully accepted and fully loved felt like until this moment. Now, thankfully they're in heaven, but how many of you know, you can experience that right now. Well, how can you say that? Well, because the Bible says that you are fully loved and fully accepted because of Jesus. The Bible says we can have peace that passes all understanding that would guard our hearts and our minds. Peace makes, that makes no sense in the midst of every situation. We see this picture really well. One day Jesus and the disciples are out in a boat. They're freaking out because the boat is taken on water. There's, there's a massive storm that has risen. There and they're probably belling water, screaming at each other. Jesus is in the back of the boat taking a nap. They finally go and wake him up, which you can always locate the disciples. They're a funny bunch. I, they just are. They give us all hope. Does anybody have a favorite disciple that you always think is like, at least I'm not him? Anybody else or is it just me? Anybody? A couple of you. They're a couple of you like, man, that, that guy right there. They go and they wake Jesus up and they said, Jesus, don't you care that we die? Like, get up, do something. And Jesus, I, I don't even know if Jesus stood up. I think he may have just said it from his pillow. You ever had your kids walk in your room at night and you're like, I ain't getting up for that? Like, that's ridiculous. I need to go to the bathroom. Just go to the bathroom. <laughs> like, don't wake me up for that. I think Jesus may have just laid there. And just commanded the winds and the waves to be calm. And instantly, everything got calm in a split second. Why? Because Jesus spoke. You know, he still calms winds and waves, by the way. Not just physical ones, but the ones that happen in our minds, the ones that happen in our souls. Is that Jesus still speaks and says, hey, peace. I mean, it's the, it's the one thing that I, well, there's a couple things that Jesus left. He left us his authority when he left, but he said, my peace I give unto you. Not somebody else's peace, not some secondary, second-rate peace. He said, the very peace that I've operated with, the very peace that let me sleep in the back of a boat in the middle of a storm, that peace I'm giving to you. I'm leaving it to you. Why? Because it's part of your inheritance as being a child of God. 
It's part of your rights. It's part of your privileges. So when we understand that and we begin to, to see the presence of God work, see, I believe that we can begin to experience heaven on earth even now in our relationship with God, but we have to look to him. We have to turn to him. We have to allow him to speak to us. And sometimes there's correction that happens because we're looking at something the wrong way. And he says, hey, let me just step into this moment. When we have those moments, I believe that it produces this, this heart of gratitude that ultimately that when gratitude begins to stir up on the inside of us, I believe that it produces this heartfelt worship. Well, what is worship? It means to give weight, to give uh, worth to. It means to adore or to magnify, to lift up. That's what worship is. And here's the thing. You're the only person that can give your worship to the Lord. Like if you, if, if you weren't participating in worship this morning, the Lord missed out on your worship because he wanted to hear from you today. He wanted to hear your voice. He wanted to see your heart lifted up in worship to him. Why? Because there's connection. So you can say it like this, or it's just, it's, it's a simple example, but what happens when we begin to worship, it would be like setting a chair up and inviting somebody to come and sit in it. When we begin to worship, what happens? God's presence begins to fill the room. Now that can happen anywhere. Anywhere that you are, you don't have to be with anybody else. I mean, Jesus has been my co-pilot while I'm driving the car sometimes. And all of a sudden, I'll be worshiping or I'll be praying, and all of a sudden, I sense the presence of God just come right into my truck. I can be out and about. I, I tried to bring the presence of God to the golf course yesterday, and he did not show up for me. I'm just saying. I mean, I, I, I mean... I was needing some presents, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but no, I mean, when we, we begin to worship God and what it is, it's, an, it's a matter of focus. It's putting and directing my attention where it needs to be. And when I, when I direct my thoughts and my heart, when I'm actually thinking about the words that I'm beginning to lift up to the Lord, that his presence is actually attracted to that. The psalmist wrote and said that, um, that he inhabits the praises of his people. Not the attitudes, not the actions. He inhabits the praise of his people. In other words, when we worship, he's going to respond. I mean, there are times in my life that all prayer didn't seem to really work for me. That quoting scriptures wasn't the thing that I needed. But there have been times when nothing else worked, seemingly worked, that as I would begin to focus upon the Lord, and some of my hardest moments of my life, that I would just begin to worship the Lord and say, God, I don't care. Because really what happened is, is I'm praying, asking God to fix the situation, as opposed to just looking at him, focusing on him worshiping him and many times those circumstances would change but more importantly what happened was that i had changed i got my attention remember hebrews 12 looking unto jesus the author and the finisher keep your focus where it needs to be see our worship prepares the place for god's presence to really rest upon us see when jesus came into jerusalem that what, what we're celebrating and what we call Palm Sunday today was really like a coronation. Now, we don't understand this really in our culture because we don't, I mean, the closest thing we would have, like if our team won a championship or something, they have a parade, right? Well, you got to think like monarchy. Like when King Charles took over the throne of England, it was a big deal, right? People lined the streets, People were throwing things at them, and there's all this stuff, and they're in like a parade and, you know, of cars and all that. It's a big deal. This is really what we see happening. And, 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 and it's interesting to see how uh, the children of Israel kind of navigated this moment because we have the opportunity to do exactly what they did 
except we have the advantage of seeing it in, in a full picture. They had a picture of what they thought Jesus was coming to do. And they begin to sing. They begin to lift up their voices. And it's actually in all four of the Gospels, there's an account of this. It's called the triumphal entry. And there's a lot about this that is nuanced but is interesting too. Because like if you're thinking like in military terms or like in a coronation, people would always come in on a large horse. In other words, they were up and above everybody. But yet Jesus looked for a little colt, a donkey specifically. It was actually prophesied that he would come, that one of the ways you would know he was the Messiah was he would not come in like the rulers of the world who always wanted to lift themselves up. But the Bible says that he came as a humble servant, and yet he, he rode on a donkey, which was not parade material. You know what I'm saying? And yet Jesus takes his donkey, and the Bible says that he begins to ride into Jerusalem. And there was a lot of fanfare around this moment. People were celebrating. People were literally lining the streets because they, were, they, they had all heard the reports. Jesus had a reputation, and it was a good one. Everywhere he goes, people are healed. People are delivered. Good things are happening. And so people were in anticipation because they were looking to overthrow the Roman government who was occupying Jerusalem. And so they were looking at Jesus more like a military leader, and they thought, oh, he's going to take out the Roman guard, he's going to remove our oppression. And so, man, they're, they're celebrating and they're worshiping, but their worship was off because they were worshiping for the wrong reasons. And the Bible says that they begin to sing and, and shout and, and, and do all these things. And so I'll read the, this passage here, and we'll kind of dialogue about it in the next couple of minutes. But it says, as they approached Jerusalem and they came back to uh, Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, it says, Jesus sent two disciples and says, go to the village ahead of, of us. At once and find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. So, in other words, go find a mom and her baby. It says, Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord has need, need of them and they will send it right away. Now, that doesn't sound like a crazy big thing. Walk over to one of these car dealerships and go grab a car, sit in it, and say, The Lord has need of this car. <laughs> That's basically what they're doing. And they didn't ask permission because Jesus says, if anybody asks, just tell them, hey, don't worry, don't worry. Jesus needs this. Jesus needs this Corvette, okay? <laughs> I just happen to be the messenger that he sent. I'm going to take it directly to him. He's waiting for me. I'll be right back. I mean, that is kind of what, it's just putting it in a modern context. It says, this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. It says, they brought the donkey and the colt and placed their uh, cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. So they put their jackets over it to be like almost like a saddle, in a sense. And then it goes on and it says, <clears throat> that they begin to spread them over, and then <clears throat> a very large cr uh, crowd begin to take their coats or their cloaks, and they begin to lay them on the road, which was a sign of honor and respect and celebration, and, and really it was a, a sign of victory. This is like, it, in a sense, this would be like having a Super Bowl parade before the Super Bowl. That's the closest thing I know to even compare it to. You're not even the victor yet, but yet you're celebrating like you're winning. I mean, I like the confidence and all, but that's really what's happening because the, the Jewish people are like, this is our moment. We've been waiting. We've been told about this for thousands of years, and here's the moment. It says others <clears throat> cut branches from the trees, which would be the palm trees, and they spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him <clears throat> and those who had followed began to shout, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then Jesus entered Jerusalem and the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? This was a scene. Like this was something like everybody was wondering what is going on in this moment? Who is this guy? And is he really the one that we've been looking for? 
And in this moment, we see that Jesus comes in and, and it creates this, this kind of this, this fervor, if you will. You know, the word Hosanna really has, it's a, it's a dual meaning word. If you read it in the Old Testament, it means save me. In other words, I'm looking forward to a Messiah. I'm looking forward to a Savior. And so you would see it in the book of Psalms many times where they would begin to declare Hosea or Hosanna, Hosanna, and they would say, and what they're saying is I need a Savior. On this side of the cross, when we begin to say things like Hosanna, what it's saying is, thank you for saving me. It's not just a churchy word. It actually has real meaning for us. And they begin to sing, is that save me, son of David. This is what they're declaring. Hosanna in the highest. Save me from God. God on, on high, save me. And so everybody wants to know, man, like who is this savior? Who is this guy? And the crowd's answer said, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. And so what would happen is that as Jesus is walking in, now you have to think about this. This is the, the same people who are saying, save me. Some of them anyways, a few days later would be the same ones declaring crucify him. Not all of them, but there were definitely some, I mean, there's always some bandwagon people. They're going to jump on the latest party. And there were some people that were going, Jesus, save us, save us, save us. But when they saw that the Romans had crucified him, their dreams were lost too because they thought, oh, Jesus is, he's coming to overthrow them. And they're like, ah, he's just another one like the others who have come before. See, they wanted somebody that would, have, that would uh, really create insurrection. They wanted somebody who would topple Rome. But see, they had an idea of the enemy that Jesus was coming to topple, but that's not the one that Jesus came to topple. It's not the one that he came to overthrow. He came to defeat an enemy, yes, but he came to defeat the enemies of sin, of death. He came to defeat Satan who had entrapped people for thousands of years in sin and in darkness and in helplessness and in hopelessness. Jesus came to overthrow him. All that was wrong, Jesus came to satisfy. This is what he's done for us. See, they were looking for a peace to come between nations, and Jesus was looking for a peace to become between a sinful man, a sinful person, and a holy God. This is why Jesus came. And they were celebrating it in one moment, but yet a few days later they had lost sight of what he actually had come to do. In Luke's <clears throat> account of this, it says that the, uh, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Because really, in this moment, this is Jesus acknowledging, yes, I am the Messiah. I am the King of the Jews. He's acknowledging his royalty, if you will. And so the Pharisees don't like that. And Jesus makes this just an astounding statement. He says, I tell you, if the people keep quiet, the very stones will begin to cry out. Creation will begin to lift up its voice and will begin to declare glory and honor and power be unto the one. Why? Because Jesus will be worshiped. The Bible says that when he returns, every tongue will confess every knee will bow. Why? Because they will see him in the fullness of who he is. Worship is the only proper response to Jesus. There is no other adequate, reasonable response. And so when we begin to lift up our voices and, and, and we begin to, to, to sing, I, I, I would challenge you with this thought. Don't let a rock worship for you because there's something unique and special about your voice You're like oh but I can't sing but it's beautiful to the Lord there's a connection that he longs to have with every single one of us we can't earn it we don't deserve it it is a free gift it's the gift of grace and by grace alone that we have to receive it 
So you just have to come open-handedly to him and say, I receive all that you've done for me. Now, I don't care if you've ever surrendered your heart to the Lord or if you've already surrendered your heart to the Lord. This is something that we ought to be praying. Lord, I want everything that you have for me. I want nothing that you don't, but I want everything that you have for me. So I receive of your grace in spite of my insecurities. I receive your grace in spite of what I know about me. I receive your grace. I receive your goodness, your life, your truth, your wisdom. God, I open up my heart to you completely. I don't want to hold anything back. Why? Because there's real freedom in that. The enemy would love to keep you bound. He would love to keep you hung up in your past, in your shame, in all of these things. And yet grace is unbelievably freeing. Let me say it another way. If you didn't earn it, you can't lose it. Now you're saying, are you saying that once saved, always saved? You can. That's not what I'm saying. I would actually challenge that thought because I grew up in church and I would have told you I was saved, but I wasn't saved. I prayed to get saved a lot, but it was words out of my mouth, but it was not a connection of my heart at all. But the grace of God is available to you, to every one of us, without measure. And at your worst, there's still grace for you. There's still compassion for you. There is still love for you, not judgment. There is love for you. The Bible says it's the goodness of God that draws us to repent. Not his judgment, not his anger, not his frustration. It's the goodness of God. And what happens many times is that we try to serve God out of duty, not out of relationship. And we wonder why it just not doesn't work right. It's just like, man, I don't, I don't know how they're living for Jesus. Apparently they got a different Jesus than I do because my experience is very different than theirs. No, Jesus is full of compassion, full of love, full of his grace. So I would encourage you this week, take some time, reflect upon the grace of God. Begin to and maybe even sit down and make a list of things that you're thankful for. Jesus, thank you for saving me. Thank you for healing my body. Thank you for delivering my mind. Thank you for freeing me of, of addiction. Thank you for, for healing our family. Thank you for rescuing me from my own stupidity. And begin to write down the things that the Lord has done for you. It's a great reminder for us, and we need it. We all do. And then out of that, man, it will produce a worship unto the Lord. A pure, honest, heartfelt worship to the Lord. And I believe that when we do that, that his presence begins to fall. We can experience the joy of our salvation. So I would encourage you this week, take a few minutes. Just go read through some of the passages of, of, of Jesus, kind of this last week of Jesus' life. Just read a little bit every day. And before you do it, just ask the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I just want to hear from you today. Highlight a truth. Highlight something that I've never seen today to me. My ears are open to you. My eyes are paying attention. I'm engaged in this moment. Holy Spirit, help me to see what I need to see. And Holy Spirit, I thank you that I have ears to hear from you. And if you do that, I mean, I believe that God's going to speak to you. I think he's going to stir some stuff up in your heart. I believe that you're going to come into Easter ready to celebrate and worship together. It's going to be a great day. And so would you guys stand up with me this morning? I want to pray over you. If you're here today and, and, and you're like, man, I, I'm in need of the grace of God. Well, it starts with a relationship with him. It starts with surrendering your heart. And so, you know, I could lead you in a prayer, but I want you to have a personal moment with somebody. And so if you're here today and you, you need to uh, really want to surrender your heart, you want to say, man, I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life. Come down here. Let one of our prayer partners pray with you today. They're going to lead you in a prayer. We want to get some resources into your hand. Maybe you're here today and you're not in relationship with God. Maybe you've been saved in the past, but you know you've walked away. Hey, there's no day like today. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Come down here, let them pray for you. If you have need of anything else, 
It doesn't matter what it is. I say it all the time. If it matters to you, I believe it matters to God. And so if, if that's you and you have just somebody, something you need agreement in, man, we believe in the power of prayer. I believe that prayer moves mountains. God responds to the, to the prayers of the saints. And so if you need prayer for anything today, grab one of those welcome home cards, write it on there real quick. And then as we worship together, before we are dismissed today, slip out of your seat, come down here, let them pray for you because I believe that it produces power in our lives. Amen. Well, let me pray. Father, I just thank you so much for today. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your truth. I thank you for your life. Father, I thank you for your abundant grace that goes beyond anything that we can understand or really fully fathom. But Father, I thank you even this week as we are engaging in your word. Father, I thank you that you're opening up our eyes to see even greater, to give us a greater revelation of, Father, your grace towards us who believe that, Father, we have to receive it by faith. But Father, I thank you that your grace is enough for every one of us. Father, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Prayer team, y'all can go ahead and come down. And if you need prayer, feel free to slip out of your seat. Uh, come down here, let them pray for you. If you don't need prayer, take this moment and just worship the Lord for a few minutes and we'll be dismissed. circumstance father and have the promise of eternity and life with you lord we just thank you for the sacrifice that was made for us to be in your presence and to be with you forever father we just praise your name in this place this morning and we thank you for what you're doing in jesus name amen well, thank you for coming to church this morning. We are so glad to have you. Don't forget on the way out to grab your um, invitation cards to the Easter service next week, as well as your communion elements. And we will see you then at 9 or 11 o'clock next week. Have a great week.